Hey guys, Easy Jeezy here. We're on the garage today, working on the 2110. I think I'm ready to, pretty close to start assembling things, and I thought I better get the camera out. Um, I'm not going to film the actual assembly, it's just tight and a bunch of bolts and screws down, and I'll do the run um, when I get it together and running, and then I'll probably put that at the beginning of the video. I don't know. There's a few things that uh, I've gotten questions on over and over again over the years when I do build videos. So I thought I'd maybe just address them now before we go any further. Um, <clears throat> this is an 82 millimeter crank, scat crank. It's got the oil journals all the way around on the mains. I'm using H-beam connecting rods, the short ones, 5.325. They came with uh, ARP fasteners. And there's some details about all of that. I've made videos on that before. Uh, they sell a stretch gauge, and these things are made in such a way that you take the measurements and you should record them on a card. When you buy a set of ARP bolts generally they're all the same size it's not like every bolt is different that group they group them together or i don't know machine them so they come out that way but uh, do not use loctite to put this together use arp assembly lube and you put it all around the threads and under the head of the screw and follow manufacturer's recommendations for tightening torque in this case i tightened them to 30 foot pounds <clears throat> put in new rod bearings, new main bearings. This has got a groove cut for the old style cam plug, but you can use the, uh, I'll, for lack of a better term, I'll call it rubber, but it's it's not, it's got some metal inside it, rubber coated. <laughs> I don't know. Here's the one I'm going to use. It's just a, a uh, camshaft end plug. And I usually put the hollow side to the flywheel and the smooth side towards the cam. And while we're looking at this, it reminds me that be careful with your cam bearings. There's three different widths. You got your thrust bearing, and that's not optional. You know where that's going to go. <clears throat> then you've got a medium sized bearing width, and that goes in the middle. And then the smaller one you put in the end. The reason I bring that up is you can put this mid-size one <clears throat> at the back. If you do that, it will block this return passage. You can see here, this is a little bit wider than this one. And the reason I know this is because I did it. Okay, I'll just tell you, I did it. <clears throat> okay, so the inside of this, as you can see, is clearanced for the rotating parts. And since this is a new case to me, don't take for granted that everything's just going to work. Different companies uh, machine these out for their brand of crankshaft. I'm using a scat crank, and I don't... Uh, this one here has a uh, blind closed in head bolt inserts. <clears throat> Some of them don't. You want to be sure and look closely at that. You can see here behind my oil pump, those holes aren't drilled all the way through for the studs that capture the oil pump. Um, Oil pickup, we've covered that before. This is a cow magnet. It came with a smaller diameter pickup tube, and I replaced it with a larger diameter one and an extended, because I'm going to use an extra deep sump, uh, one and a half quart oil sump. <clears throat> um, this is the oil pump that caused all the crap. And I'm not sure that it was the oil pump's fault. It could have been the oil light switch but I've I've never had it fail at another date or since and the light came on that's what's 
started this whole debacle is, uh, I like that word, debacle. I watch that Motor Trend channel, and he uses that all the time. <laughs> I never heard that word until I started watching Motor Trend, David Freiberger. Yeah, I love that, those guys. Um, so, the light came on, and I took the engine apart to inspect the case. My 1800, or about this time last year, sucked a valve guide and beat the hell out of the piston, and I <clears throat> have always had a temperature and an oil pressure problem with that block. And with that 88 piston being beat up, I thought to myself, why don't I make a 1914 out of that? This was my thought process a year ago. Is why not make it into a 1940 instead of buying a replacement piston? And I think they were out of the pistons at AA last year about this time. Whatever it was, the parts weren't available. And I just thought, I'm going to buy one of those aluminum blocks. And I'm going <clears> to <throat> move all my 2110 stuff over to that. And then I'll use the old case that was my 2110, put the 74 stroke crank from my 1800, go with the 90.5 pistons that I already had. Yeah, I had this all worked out in my mind. It was going to be beautiful. <laughs> it didn't work out that way. Um, there was just continuous problems. I got to go see where that dog went. <clears throat> come here. Hey, come here. Yeah, she's into something. Come here. No. As long as I broke my train of thought here. Uh, this is not the dog I had last year. <clears throat> but early last December, I, the Lord put this thing in my hands. She has heartworm. And we had to go through the whole <clears throat> procedure. That was painful. She's 65 pounds, two years old. Does not bark never barks unless I'm in a confined space with another person that she doesn't know then she'll growl and possibly bark because she thinks she's protecting me <clears throat> she's obviously had puppies and she came up from Texas we don't have heartworm here in Colorado it's not natural because we don't have the right climate for them to uh, survive up here <clears throat> And uh, I hope she, I hope she lives through it. Um, she's pretty easy going. She's the easy part of Jeezy. I think that's what I'll call her. So, <laughs> yeah, she's pretty low key. She doesn't play with toys. She won't chase a ball. She just sleeps, eats, and loves. That's all she knows how to do. I think she was locked in a, a garage with a bark collar, in a cage, and just pumping out puppies sad but we'll see what happens hopefully I'll be able to keep her we'll see what happens so <clears throat> anyhow where were we where were we um we were talking about my engine <laughs> oh and the oil pump and the reason why I started this whole thing <clears throat> so let's keep going here we got a lot to cover um, again, I always, you know, this is a brand new oil pump. This one had a groove cut in the back and an O-ring in there. And the O-ring <coughs> was in line with the hole on the other case. It never did seal it off. And I could have been sucking air there. I don't know. <clears throat> so I'm using this brand new 26 millimeter Shidek pump and I've taken a <clears throat> quarter inch pipe tap <clears throat> you're gonna run that tap and the tip of that tap the taps that I had was too long and it uh, I had to grind some of it off once I got through there <clears throat> it's a ten dollar tap uh, Irwin Hansen <clears throat> high carbon steel but I can use that again and it it wasn't too hard to get started you don't have to drill the hole out you can just start turning it into the pump but I'm going to use a full flow system 
and I <clears throat> went to the hardware store and bought that quarter inch pipe plug that has a hex head on it. I ground a little bit of that off because that's deep enough that you can do that. And I ran the tap in and I ground a little bit of the end of the tap off so that I could get the plug in there below the surface without forcing it. Then <clears throat> what you want to do is take the gears and I take a you can use like a ceramic rod uh, a knife a sharpening stone just a small stone I, I've got it right here um, I just happen to have this you, you these are all like machinist stones and they're different sizes and you know machinists when they're machining stuff might want to take a burr or an edge and uh, so it fits perfect down all along the edges so I just sat down in front of the TV with a towel on my lap and I went took that sharp edge it was it was machine and it was a sharp corner and you could feel it and now you can't um, I'm often asked what's what are you supposed to do with those dots on the end of the gears are you supposed to line those up what are you supposed to do with them there's a dot on both of these well I've never read anything about this but after <laughs> studying it and looking at it and fondling this thing for quite some time to do all these things you'll note that right here there's a little hole okay now that could be for centering it could be part of the machine process these dots could be in there as part of a uh, indexing it when they're machining it or some way to keep track of something but there's only one dot on one side on each of these gears your oil comes in on this side it spreads out it goes through the gears and it comes goes out on that side one of the things that I do is I will take that sharp corner because it's just a 90 degree hole and I'll lay that over I don't know if you can see that in here you can see the right side of that suction hole lays to the right <clears throat> that's to allow the oil to freely go behind the gear you don't want it to have to come over here and then come back the other side and then cross over it it, it just makes uh, all fluid and air and anything that you can imagine anytime it has to turn or go around a corner think of your intake ports and the airflow there's you know when you're porting and polishing heads there's a lot of subtle things that can make a big difference and by doing these things especially to those pumps with the screw on cartridge I picked up six pounds at an idle from what I had previously and so I know it works and I know it's worth doing and what I think I'm gonna yeah, I've been doing this you take your pumps apart and you see all the scratches and things that are in there well that's because there's no real filter the stock one has a screen on there and it's it's always a good idea to even if you have a full flow system to do your initial break-in at 2500 rpm for 20 minutes with that screen stock screen in there that way if you've got any uh, sealer or something that that any garbage that's coming around in there it'll hopefully it'll stop it before it comes to your pump and starts scratching up your pump so my feeling is that that mark is a dent it's a low spot it's pressed in there it's not deforming anything but it's pressed in there and so I'm thinking that is capturing a little piece of oil and it's spreading around the back side of the gear you see how that hole lines up down there that's just about where the mark is let's just put that mark over that hole okay and so if this one <clears throat> is facing the other way we'll put the mark to the bottom it's not gonna scratch anything doesn't make any difference where you put it you don't line them up uh, I don't really think that makes any difference but 
it's right over that hole. And the, the oil that's in there, it just seems to me that that's just a little reservoir to maybe get a little lubricant on the wall. There's supposed to be a spacer. And you use the thin gasket on the back side here. I don't put sealer on it. This groove that goes around the side of the pump here comes to the suction side of the pump. So, in theory, <laughs> it's in theory now, if oil escapes, it's going to get caught and sucked back to there. Okay? I, I like to save my oil on the driveway area right underneath the engine kind of keep the dust down so dust doesn't get up on my engine <laughs> so so yeah we know how good that works another thing you can take a sanding drum to do some of this work on a dremel tool i can see these but man it's it's like i can't really feel them uh but i went around this edge this was a sharp edge this is a steel plate that i'm going to reuse and of course goes without saying you really want to clean this stuff out if you're going to be sanding and grinding and and reshaping things to make sure those particles uh, are gone and you lubricate it up real good put a little you can use this is one of the few places you can put some grease in there so that it it grabs and sucks real good and it's a good idea before you put your rocker arm assemblies in the head on the on the heads and adjust everything that you crank your engine over with the spark plugs out and let that oil pump pressure come up get your all the galleys and stuff filled or not I've done it both ways it's just you know if you want to be anal about it it's just something that you can do and since this isn't a mass production project it's just kind of a you can take your time and you can do things like that um, a lot of people won't and don't and wouldn't even think of it and don't own their cars long enough to know the difference and gosh the way I take rotate stuff around that's for darn sure um, I'm gonna be using these gaskets on my dual carbs because I want to stop the transfer of heat and I need a good seal the factory ones that are <clears throat> aluminum if you're using the stock intake manifolds you want to use those you want to transfer heat into those intakes manifold it helps keep your gasoline in suspension it takes a while for it to warm up but that's the only reason I can think of that they use the metal they obviously have gaskets in other areas but it's very important because gasoline doesn't burn and if it condenses after it goes through the carburetor it gives it a chance to flash off again all this happens in unbelievable short periods of time and everybody's had them run without it I mean Think of the millions of engines out there that don't use a thermostat and keep the flaps wide open. Then you add an extra oil sump or a heat exchanger and, and you, you put it in your car or your bus and you're ripping down the highway in the summertime and you know you think you're just getting full the best cooling all the time. Those, everything is designed to have those flaps in the position that they were designed for so you get the even distribution of air your spark plug boots should be sealing good and this is I'm just babbling I'm just spouting off as things come to mind uh, <coughs> darn it talking too much um, Loctite gasket eliminator 518 <coughs> I've used it before I bought some more this I just use it on the case I don't use it under the cylinders because it's too damned expensive it's 35 bucks for a tube of this stuff but uh, supposedly I read that the factory uses that um, and it seems to me factory engines leak eventually everything does right 
One of my favorites is this stuff here. Aviation Forma Gasket 3H. Um, and it's got the right kind of little acid brush in it. This one works as well. Uh, Permatex High Tack Gasket Sealant. It's kind of a red color. Goes on nice. This stuff is brown. It's similar to this. Looks like it, but it's got a big shoe dauber. A big old fluffy dauber. I don't know if you're painting your bathroom, it'd be great. Um, I'm going to replace my oil relief capture nuts with, with, these, with this style rather than the slotted screwdriver. Don't over torque those. You'd be crying if you stripped the threads out of your case. If you have oil pressure problems, <clears throat> you might want to <clears throat> drop those pistons and check them. If you buy a gear or you have a camshaft with, it might, you might buy a camshaft that has the gear attached, riveted on there, but then you set it in your engine block and it's too tight or it's too loose. Then you're going to have to get a different gear. Usually they make them a zero gear when they sell those and put them on like that. And the factory made 15 different sizes. They made uh, 1 through 7 plus and 1 through 7 minus and zero. So they were, there's different possibilities. Of course you can go with straight cut gears and a lot of guys like them. If you've got a lot of valve spring pressure, it's easier on your thrust bearing because when you have this helical cut, you're you're pushing. It's it's to keep it quiet, but it it's also forcing the camshaft back. Um, this camshaft was clearanced professionally. I paid extra for that, and uh, they they just put it in a grinder or did it. My my clearancing, you've seen that. In my videos it looks like a beaver chewed on it and uh you know it's trial and error trial and error that's what the name of the game is i'm using stock style brand new head bolts these have appeared on the market recently and uh instead of the chrome only i'm going with the eight millimeter in this style as long as we're here <clears throat> and the older engines they use this 12 millimeter nut that you capture it with a use a 17 millimeter wrench or socket and there was a washer underneath that and the torque specification was 18 pounds I'm going to use these sealing nuts and I don't put the seal towards the case I put it away from the case and since it's larger, I'm going to use the washer and I'm going to torque it to 25 foot pounds. Do your research. You strip something out or screw something up, don't, don't tell me about it. You got to make your choices. That was uh, many years ago what Gene Berg recommended, and some materials aren't as good as they used to be. So just keep that in mind. Here's some nylock nuts I bought at uh, the hardware store. 12 millimeter um, and then I just sort of changed my mind one book I read they said specifically use this nut put the ceiling size down and don't use the the flat washer that's the most stupid thing I ever heard of this is what keeps your main bearings uh, clearance right these are soft cases I wouldn't even consider doing that on an aluminum engine case you can scratch this with your fingernail. <laughs> it, it, why would you subject it to that? I, I think you'd be asking for trouble, and I'd be willing to bet. Somebody can let me know. You put 5,000 miles on that engine, and then put a torque wrench back on it, and see if what the torque would be to what you originally, compare it to what you originally torqued it to. And... I bet it'll start turning. This engine, um, 
I changed the compression in it had the heads off I changed heads and uh, I I checked my case for my mains for tight torque and uh, two of them tightened I think it was the center ones to tell you the truth I can't remember doesn't really matter <clears throat> talk about here I'm using a six pound equalizer pulley um, this was the old one. My rotating assembly was balanced one be once before, so I don't feel I have to do that again. That's an interesting sound, isn't it? <clears throat> so, yeah. If, uh, if you've got a used case that you're rebuilding, you might want to replace your studs. These doggone little six millimeter studs sure take a beating and some of those nuts and sometimes you hit stuff and you know how the covers get do it now it's a lot easier to do it now uh, I've had these things break off trying to uh, get them out somebody put Loctite in them find out now and I, I probably should have just some nuts hanging on here just to protect the threads and uh, be sure that you've got your pickup tube secured. I got a washer and a nylock nut. That's the way this came from the factory. Uh, what else? I think that's enough information. I don't know if I mentioned the cam. This is going to, it's a 2110 build, but it's um, equivalent to an Engel 100, although it's not an Engel cam. And, uh, I think that'll be fine. So I could run, maybe try, experiment with running a center mount carburetor and having it really smooth. I'm still not done experimenting with that center mount setup. It, they really would work a lot better off road. But you got to have heat in that manifold. So uh, don't forget to put your new washers or O rings down here. That's why. You don't have to do all that crazy stuff, and I don't put a lot of sealer and stuff. Man, I've taken some inches apart. You spend that cleaning, even though this is a new engine block. You got to do a lot of cleaning, and uh, if you're if you're nuts, if you can't turn them on by hand, I'm not left-handed guys, but if they don't go on like that. You need to run a die down there and make it that way. Yeah, how else are you going to get an accurate torque reading if, if this thing is hanging up on some old uh, silicone or something? Okay, I want to take a minute here and I've got my case bottom end assembled. I've got the larger case nuts here. It takes a 19 millimeter socket instead of a 17. Got the seal side out. I've got my piston and cylinder in for number one cylinder. I've got my deck height measuring tool. And instead of rotating the engine one way till it stops on the stop bolt and then rotating it the other way until it stops and then you measure across your flywheel that's how you can verify if the zero if you have a mark or a, a degreed wheel you can verify where actual top dead center is I thought it would be fun today so I just tried to take my Harbor Freight dial indicator and there's just enough space to get this thing on there and what we're doing it doesn't make any difference where zero is it doesn't make any difference where the dial is all you want to do is see where it changes direction okay and this is accurate okay <laughs> that's too close to zero I want to have fun with you here so we're not reading a measurement here all we're doing all we're doing is finding top dead center. So wherever the needle changes direction, that's top dead center. And that's one of the things we need to know for timing 
as well as now we'll take the tool off. We know we're at top dead center, right? Okay, this should should have released. What's holding it here? I'm caught on something. <laughs> Gosh darn it. <laughs> okay. We know we haven't bumped it. We haven't rotated it. So we know we're still on top dead center. Now you can do one of two things. This is that stop nut. You can overturn it in like I explained or at this point you just can find it with the dial indicator and then you can turn it down <clears throat> until it touches. You're just making contact. Now I can take my other dial indicator. I don't know if that's the whole thing's going to be in the viewfinder here. Oop. Now, I'm going to make sure that this is zeroed out as best I can. And now it's closed and it's zeroed out. Now I'm going to take the, the flat spot and I'm going to lay it right here and I'm going to feel <laughs> sure I'm going to feel it and I'm just going to go down until it touches the top of the piston or you could make it longer and just use the the force of the tool to touch. Particular one, the bottom scale is thousandths of an inch and the top scale is millimeters. You want no less than 40 thousandths deck height ever. You get <clears throat> tolerance stacking as things wear out and you don't want the piston coming up and hitting anything. Okay, same tool, same setup, moved it over to the flywheel, put the uh, needle on the case, it's the crankshaft end play that we're going to measure. It's, it, you don't have to do it this way, I'm just I'm not going to spend a lot of time showing you all the options. It's just if you have this tool, it's it's real handy and sweet. So there's zero. There's three and a half. So spec is between three and five with a wear limit of six. Okay, next step is to decide which heads I'm going to use on this. And I'm going to do an experiment. I want to run stock valve heads. I've been grouping my springs. Um, I've got this device right here. And that's an inch and a half uh, tall steel block. And what I do is I zero out my scale with uh, one spring on it. And I gotta raise my stand here. Oh boy. I just had a head on here. I was checking the, I bought brand new Autolina heads because I didn't want the ones that come factory ported. You're just losing valve guide support. <clears throat> and I already lost a valve guide, and that was a very expensive thing. So I don't want to do that again. So what I do whoop, is I, I've i got it set up. <clears throat> I'll zero out my scale here. And then what I'll do is I want to see at the resting height. I can feel it hit that metal bar. It's about 70 PSI. Okay? Now, here's another one. In a different grouping, I'm grouping my springs. This is about 70 as well. Now, here are some heavy duty single springs, and I've made sure I've got those all grouped.
it's about 115 where I hear the click so that's your resting height and all of these are within like a pound or two and you can use shims underneath these springs to increase the spring pressure and or to balance out so all of them are exactly the same I hope this is the box uh, I put all of this stuff away this is for the stock spring base if you're running dual springs um, you go with this style and you just have to stack them and it's it's amazing what one of these let's just try it let's see yeah let's just let's set, just set I want to show you how sensitive this stuff is okay so we're gonna go down it's about um, 115 pounds now I'm gonna add this I'll put it on the bottom because you know as you compress the spring the pressures going up right so you can do that if you have space for your lift there's about five pounds difference adding this shim now the question is going to be oh good my calipers I live with these things I should have these surgically attached to my body um <laughs> all right okay so a 30,000 shim makes increases your spring pressure by five pounds a heavy duty single spring is going to be about 115 pounds uh, resting and about 180 depending on what the cam lift is so when you start putting performance camshafts in them and you're compressing the spring more it it is increasing the spring pressure the higher it goes up the lobe but it's a waste of horsepower to have unnecessary spring pressure if that makes any sense to you now let's see I wanted to show you this. This is why I turned the camera on. This is a brand new Autolina head, and it has uh, had to be. If I was going to use it, I'd take it apart and clean it. But it has the chrome moly uh, keepers and the chrome moly retainers and the heavy duty single springs. And I just checked this one uh, before I was doing this and I wanted to show you this seal that Autolina is starting to put on there. It doesn't it feels feels like rubber but I doubt it's rubber and uh, it's uh, kind of like a valve guide seal which is kind of crazy because they never used to come with that in there and I don't know if you can see it I mean it'll light it over here um, yeah every one of them has got it and it it's pushes it just naturally pushes up I don't know how long those things would last, you know, to be truthful. But it's supposed to be a stock head for, uh, it's an Autolina head. And uh, just in case, <laughs> it makes you kind of suspicious. Autolinia. When you start corresponding with these suppliers and they can't even spell the name of the product correctly, I think it was... Uh, Auto lean, lean. I think they left the e out or something. And uh, lean auto. How was it that I don't know? It was, it was last year, but uh, kind of lose confidence. Uh, some folks, if they're going to be doing high RPM setups, will put these underneath the springs. It says this side up, and it will bite into the head instead of your spring moving around and chafing if you if you ever can find it man there's some awesome uh, research on automotive valve springs 
and at what RPMs. Man, these things start dancing at top RPM. I'm not kidding you. It is truly amazing. And that's why they use spring dampers. And they don't, you know, there's so many combinations and configurations in this stuff. It, it's just, you know, but they make these in, uh, now the thing with this copper one, that wouldn't get picked up in my magnet and it would go through the pump and then it would hopefully get caught in the oil filter but yeah some stuff I ordered back in the day here's some here's some thinner ones um, for double springs you can put you can stack them you can increase your valve pressure but I you know I would buy heavy-duty springs just because the resting rate is higher than using some 50 year old uh, springs that you know, the on a stock spring, it goes more like 70 to 75 pounds at the resting height installed. And then at full lift, it'll go up to like 140, between 140 and 150 is what I usually see. Maybe 135 to 145. You know, and it and they're gonna it's gonna vary. Uh, some racers actually go through the trouble of when they park their car for off season, they'll unbolt the rocker assemblies because you know there's no way all of these are gonna be up when you park it for months and months on end. So that spring tension, you know, they'll they'll say the same thing about uh, magazines. In uh, pistols and rifles, if you got a 30 round magazine, you shouldn't pack that thing with 30 rounds and throw it in the closet for 10 years and expect it to go, you know, hitch free. You might get lucky, but you know, in that case, it might be important when <laughs> you might want it to work when you want it to work. Um, these are the old heads that were on my two liter. And that thing ran awesome. Stock valve heads. And they're 62cc chambers. And I've got 60, um, 55 thousandths deck height. So I think I'm going to go with that rather than add spacers underneath my cylinders. I'm going to keep the deck height where it's at and uh, get the volume I need to arrive at the it's about eight and a half to one compression is what I'm going to be running, which is right what the cam manufacturer suggested. So that's uh, that's what we're doing. Yeah, here's the stuff right here. Gene Berg, valve spring shims. Got uh, assortment packs and stuff. Yeah, I used to... When I first got in that sand rail stuff, man, I was, <laughs> I was doing all of this stuff. And that's why uh, I started buying more and more tools and I fabricated... A couple of sand rail frames and did all sorts of stuff but I, I don't want to get to babbling along too much here um, this is just an old valve and I just stuck it up inside the 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 chuck and it makes a great little device and you can you if you're very careful you can put your your valves in like this and and turn it on it's not plugged in and you can kind of get a squirrel polish get some emery cloth and clean them up, get that carbon off the bottom. I, I just use my my brush over there on the on the stand, but uh, yeah, we've got stuff scattered every place around here. It's the usual mayhem, and I want to get this uh, these heads set up. This tripod isn't as tall as the one I used to use, and uh, the I apologize for some of the lighting. Uh, I saw a lot of glare. I was just kind of looking at some videos this morning to check and see if I had to do some of this stuff over again. Um, I think my hands are going to be in the way. So at any rate, you want to get your uh, retainer somewhat centered. Start pulling it down. Um, make sure that it centers up on your valve guide. I've got my keepers ready to go right here. Um, I also have some, uh, these are, <laughs> compared to some of the valve springs that I've used, these things are real easy to hold down. You can get, you can get a workout doing this on, on some of that high RPM stuff. You know, if you, if you like high RPM, you ought to consider building a small mortar. 
you know, you can you can make a lot of horsepower in a you know, a 1600 or gosh, okay. Now, this is exactly what I was talking about. Keep some tweezers or some needle nose over because I wasn't having good luck until I turned the camera back on. These things get flipped around and uh <laughs> Yeah, I had to tell you how easy this made things. They have those big jobs like C-clamps that that uh, we used to use those. That don't look right. I have my magnet handy, so it's like I'm starting over. <laughs> God, if you guys only knew how much I do struggle. <laughs> you piece of... <sighs> Alright. i got to make sure the dog doesn't run off again. Everybody's... Ah, I'm, I'm feeling good. <laughs> Yay! Holy smokes! And when you get them all done, you want to take a plastic mallet and tap on them uh, on the top of the valve stem just to uh, help settle things in place. Uh, make sure the keepers are keeping. This this is tapered, and uh, once you start doing a few of them, and that last head went so friggin' smooth. There we go. So I thought, oh, okay, I better get the camera. I'm kind of, I'm thinking I should go to the grocery store, but they've been talking about it on the news. It's supposed to be one of those big spring storms. And uh, I'm sure the, the shelves are... Now that snap that you heard, um... These have sharp corners on these chromoly retainers, and that's why you want to tap them with a hammer. That uh, was the sound of the spring fully seating on that retainer. A lot of guys put cams in, and they just use the stock stuff. But I've I've been doing it, you know, Gene Berg style for so friggin' long. Uh oh. I uh, also noticed I'm short one keeper. And I counted those things like three times. <laughs> and you know the keepers are uh, tapered. And generally when you buy the racer style keepers, the... Uh, there's there's a gap so that the valves don't spin on stock ones that's made out of a, a softer cast material and it's intentionally done so they always tell you to line up your rocker arms uh, off center on the valve so that it spins it and that's one of the things that works it and makes it work and we're not doing that we're um, we're just gonna go racer style. Are you kidding me? I'm gonna have to look around here on the floor. Man, I tell you, I counted those things a couple of times. Ah! Nope, that's a stock one. They're, uh, the chrome moly ones are kind of black and, and shiny. And no, I would not. I'll find it. That's what I'm gonna do. I wouldn't substitute something and screw it up. I want this to be the same. It must have uh, fallen on the floor. Found it. 
Ta-da! Two of them. Um, so you can tell just by the color. The uh, And these are used. They're old. So... You know, I am really blessed <laughs> in so many ways to... Uh, I was really down in the dumps there for a long time, and I just couldn't get up. But I'll tell you, just getting out here in the garage with the dog, has, and the sun's just shining a little bit, has kind of perked me up. My friends are, some of my old friends are down in uh, California running the sand dunes, and I'm not there. Um, I just don't have the setup to be comfortable, and the last time I went there, I, I had uh, a place to stay um, with that arrangement. Um, I suppose I could go down for a while, but... So you just, that's all you need to do. Just kind of helps seat those keepers and things. All right, let's go out to the front of the house and continue the project here. <laughs> There's my, uh, looks like a Carmen Gia from here, doesn't it? Somebody making it down the street. I shoveled this out probably two or three times yesterday. I didn't get very far in the driveway. And I gotta be very slow and cautious today because uh, my heart condition. And I've been feeling it. Boy, the wind was blowing. <laughs> so better get started. It's a wet one. I think this is enough for this go around. Whew. So here it is, about four o'clock in the afternoon. And this, <laughs> this is the longest it's ever taken me in my life to shovel the driveway. I think I did it in uh, four foot increments. And as you can see, the snow is melting. The snow. The water is what's going to be the problem. That's what's going to be the problem. It's uh, 50 degrees in front of my house against this uh, red brick. Everything seems to generate heat here, but um, oh man, it we had uh, rain. It was beautiful last week, and then we had. Uh, it rained the whole day before, and it, it rained turned to snow when we got this, and we ended up with like 24 inches of snow here, and it was blowing and drifting around, and now it's, uh, I'm out here in a, a t-shirt. <laughs> Just got out of the shower, and, uh, and I gotta go around the, tomorrow, we'll see how my back feels. Uh, I gotta go around the foundation well, of the house. Well, it's a couple days later. Dog and I just tired of being cooped up in the house. Thought we'd go for a little putt around the block. <laughs> yeah, I guess this will be considered a record breaker since I've lived here. But it's a beautiful day. It's melting fast. It was raining before it turned to snow, so everything is still draining underneath. Water on the lake there. The ice was gone. We had a really nice week last week. And here they are. These are the bad boys. I guess one of these guys did come down our street. These are the guys that made the mess.
You know, it's it's not so much the amount of snow that we got snow. There's a lot of places that uh, this is the norm in the winter time, but this was kind of unusual for here. But the the real contrast is that the <laughs> the sun's out and the roads dry, and then you got seven foot piles of snow. So that's that's the strange part of it all. Yeah. And it's going to continue to melt slow, which is a good thing. Um, it's only going to be in the 40s, and then it'll refreeze at night. <laughs>